Oh, hello everyone, and uh, thanks for tuning in. I'm Des Delahaye from RSK Biosensors, and it's my pleasure uh, to host this webinar, where we're going to hear Dr. Tim Hounsom talking about a new initiative in communicating and developing uh, bird survey guidance. But before we start, inevitably, there's a few housekeeping issues to go through. So first of all, um, in order to prevent any uh, any heckling or face pulling, all attendees' cameras and mics will be turned off throughout the entire webinar. But that doesn't mean that we don't want to hear from you. So please, if you've got any questions, then do post them in the questions dialog box, and we'll try to rattle through as many as possible after the presentation. And then finally, uh, just to let you know that after the webinar sometime, you'll receive a request to provide some feedback. If you can take a few minutes to uh, let us know what you think, then that will be great. It will help us to refine and improve our offerings in the future. So back to the uh, the main event. I have known Tim for more years than I care to remember. Uh, he has been uh, a lifetime uh, keen birder and bird ringer. He was able to indulge that interest uh, during his, his PhD, which was on ground nesting birds. Uh, during which I had the pleasure slash challenge of supervising him. Uh, he then moved into consultancy, founding the company Biosensus, before going on to become the MD of RSK Biosensus. And those of you who will have had the misfortune to bump into him in a bar, perhaps at a sign conference, will know only too well about his favourite hobby horse, which is the need to base methods in ecological cons consultancy on firm scientific evidence rather than on received wisdom. Uh, but we love him for it, uh, partly because he's the boss, but also more importantly, because he's absolutely right. Uh, so without further ado, let me hand over to Tim. So hopefully he can uh, convince you of the merits of this new initiative on evidence-based bird survey guidance. Over to you, Tim. Thanks very much, Des. Okay. Thanks very much for that introduction. Um, hopefully the technology is all working fine. Um, I was going to say that, I was going to actually tell you that Des was my PhD supervisor, but um, he's already done that. Um, so I think I've got away with that, considering what he could have said. Um, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, as you should all now be fully aware, I'm going to be talking about the new bird survey guidelines. Um, to, be fair, to be fair, if that's not what you're expecting, then something's gone horribly wrong, but, but please hang around. Um, as with all presentations, the structure looks deceptively simple. What was wrong, what we've done to sort it out so far, and what we intend to do in the future. I'm hoping to keep the messaging in the presentation this simple as, as I run through it. A bit of a heads up, the, the guidelines as they stand, and what I'm primarily talking about today, are for breeding bird surveys. Um, there's going to be plenty more added to, to the, the guidelines in the future, but this was our sort of start of a 10. So what was wrong? Um, I've been involved in bird surveys for ecological consultancy for 20 years. <laughs> I had to work that out the other day and it scared me to death, but anyway, 20 odd years. Um, and pretty much since that first job in 2001, I've been repeatedly surprised at the lack of guidance on the subject. This in turn leads to an awful lot of inconsistency within, it, within the industry. Um, lots of consultants are all doing their own thing with some of it based on half-remembered examples from the past. Um, and of course, this inconsistency is perpetuated when junior staff are told, this is how we do bird surveys. I also think this lens then tends to lend itself to um, a lack of critical thinking or questioning of why we're doing what we're doing and why we're doing it like that. Having said all that, for what it's worth, in my own my personal experience, most ontological consultants are actually doing a pretty good job. It's just often in isolation and in their own way. Um, so it en ends up being inconsistent across the industry. As you can see from this photo, there is actually a lot of guidance out there about doing bird surveys. But the trouble is none of these publications you can see here specifically deal with surveys for impact assessment on developments other than perhaps wind farms. Um, there's a couple of publications there. The top right is the, is the classic Bibby, which shows you how to do bird census and 
and record where birds are and how many there are and stuff. It's very much academic focused. Um, the bottom left is um, Gilbert et al, um, which deals with species specific monitoring things. So when you have a particular species, you need to measure it. None of these actually pull all this together in an essential um, repository of, of information and guidelines. For those of you that are aware of the, the wider birding world or the ornithological world, this lack of guidance is, seems quite incongruous when you compare it to other taxa groups like uh, great crested newts or bats, water voles, badgers, whatever. There, there are so many more members of bird NGOs and all the other groups. Um, in fact, I think there's more members of the RSPB than all the political parties put together. So the impact and the expertise of these NGOs and um, academic institutions that feed into them is phenomenal. And the number of interested and extremely well-informed and skilled volunteers that they deploy means that it, it sort of suggests that sketching out a few basic guidelines for how to do bird surveys for impact assessments would have been done ages ago. It hasn't. And I'm not having a go at those organisations. But I think for a while there's been a big disconnect between um, the world of academia and NGOs and the consultancy world. Uh, and I'm sure they won't mind me saying that when I first spoke to the BTR about this a number of years ago, I spent a lot of time initially talking to them about what consultants did. There was that much of a gap. So the bottom line is that the guidance that is there, that's on my desk, um, isn't quite fit for purpose for ecological consultants. So what was needed? What I'm going to quickly do now is run through some of the problems that arise um, from this lack of consistency across the industry and this lack of central source of guidelines or, or guidance. And this slide and the next slide is, is actually a condensed version of a 20 minute presentation in its own right. So I'm not going to go into too much detail, um, but just want to highlight where I think all the main problems are or were maybe. Um, probably the first thing to point out is the difference between a breeding bird survey or a survey of breeding birds and the BBS or the breeding bird survey which was established by BTO, the British Trust for Ornithology. Um, it's, I think it's just an unfortunate coincidence of nomenclature to be honest but it has been really quite un, un, uh, unfortunate. For those of you who don't know the BBS uh, replaced the common bird census, the CBC, back in I don't know, the early 90s and both schemes were designed to monitor changes that's the key word in the national and regional populations of breeding birds in the uk the important point here is that the bbs methodology is designed to detect change in populations but it isn't designed to establish an inventory of, of all the birds that are using the site how many they are how they're using the site how important that site is for them it's a completely different question and that's often the question that as ecological consultants we're asking um, therefore, the BBS method is wholly unsuitable for ecological impact assessment. Now, many people in the industry know this, but of course, if you're coming into this new and you're a junior or an early career practitioner, this is really quite confusing. Another weird effect of the BBS being morphed into this breeding bird survey that, that consultants do is that it's often quoted as the requirement number of required number of visits to a site is three. Um, and certainly when you set up a new square to survey for the BBS, then you, you do three surveys. You have your first survey mapping the habitats and setting your route, and then you do two sampling surveys. Subsequent years, you only ever do two. So not only is three wrong, but it's, it's wrong. It's even, it's even more wrong because actually when you do the surveys yourself, it's only two. So anyway, to quickly run through some of these other issues or inconsistencies. Um, this is a big one. When are they required? When do you decide to do those surveys in the first place? There is huge inconsistencies across the industry here. Local planning authorities do and don't request them. Um, consultants do and don't suggest them. Wildlife trusts and other NGOs often try and insist on them. And understandably, most developers don't want them. Or rather, I should say that they want to do the minimum required to get their planning consent, which is understandable. They're, they're in this for, as a business and they don't want to do any more than they have to necessarily. Uh, once you've decided to do your surveys, um, how many survey visits do you do? Another massive area of inconsistency, and I've just mentioned that the idea that there was three is a, a historic misunderstanding, but I've heard everything from one to ten in my time. And obviously there's pressure from clients to minimise this number. Um, and it's also fair to say that, of course, in different habitats, 
they probably warrant different levels of effort. I mean, I, I was asked to do 10 survey visits once to a car park in Sheffield, uh, which obviously was way over the top, but I've also been asked to just have a quick look-see, um, as, in, as in one visit, to a broadleaf woodland in, in lowland England. So you get everything in between. Um, timing. When do you do your first and last visit? What time of the year are we doing this? Um, how far apart should they be? Um, do you do them all week after week and leave it at that? Um, what time of day do you do them? Do you do them at dawn or whatever? I mean, believe it or not, there's disagreement over dawn, first light, an hour after, etc. And I have actually heard of people doing surveys for birds in the middle of the day, which I think most ornithologists would agree is inappropriate. But in the absence of clear gu guidelines, what would a less experienced or early career practitioner, how would they know this? Uh, the next, next one's a little bit uh, thorny, shall I say, or tricky, is who should do them? Um, how good do they need to be? There's a good chance, for instance, if you were doing a survey for, I don't know, black grouse or hen harriers or something on a moorland for a, a wind farm assessment, that you could take a dedicated, diligent, um, novice up to the hill, sit him down and say, these are hen harriers, um, ignore everything else with feathers, in fact, look, ignore everything else today, whenever you see one of those, write down what they're doing and where they're and map them and so on. And actually, they'd probably do, assuming they're okay, they could do a reasonable job by the end of that training session. Put that person in a lowland woodland in breeding season where 90% of your registrations are done by ear alone, and they'd be, you know, completely out of the depth. So, being appropriately trained for the for the job at hand is important, but how do we know that somebody's competent? How do we assess that? I mean, I've personally done hundreds of bird surveys since since that first one back in 2001 as a consultant, and, and at no point has anybody ever come out and assessed how good I am in the field. So, how do you do it? <laughs> That's quite a big one. How should they be done? So methods. I mean, every site's different. But there is going to be some general principles about how you do them. But again, people tend to make this up as they go along. And I should again reiterate that, generally speaking, I think it's done pretty well. But it is done very much on a whim and how a bespoke thing for each time. I think having some consistency there would be useful. Once you've got the data in, how do you interpret them? Um, as many of you will know, consultants, we are as consultants, we're required to assess the importance of a site that is commonly done by placing its importance at a geographic scale. So its importance is, how important is this site at a local scale, a regional scale, national or even international? And judging this, especially at the smaller scales, requires a lot of knowledge. I mean, if it's important at an international scale, then you'd hope that it'd already be designated and so on. But at the regional or the local scale, um, this can be really hard to do. And I think lends itself to one of the biggest inconsistencies in, in our sector, is this idea of the valuation of a site. Uh, I mean, it's really important, of course, because you know the, the client wants to, you know, doesn't want you to say this is of national importance when it isn't. Um, but also sometimes if it gets rejected through planning and you have to go through a public inquiry, you as a consultant are gonna have to defend your decision about that. And it is it's hard work. Uh, final point here is that for many years, I was told that we couldn't submit records our records to the likes of the BTO or bird track or, or whatever uh, because of client confidentiality. But actually, in my experience, most clients, to be fair, most clients just glaze over when you start talking to them about this anyway. Um, but even if they actually know who you are and what you were doing, they often don't care whether you're submitting the records, especially when you tell them that you know, the, the location is going to be to the nearest two by two kilometer square. Um, occasionally, you'll get a client that will say no, and you'll say fair enough, and of course, you need to honor that. But I think by default, we should be submitting our data. Um, as consultants, we certainly use all that freely accessible data that the BTO produce and the atlases and the county bird reports from the county bird groups and so on. So we should be feeding back. And you think about the number of thousands and thousands of, of, of field hours that are put into consultant surveys, that is really useful information that should be feeding back in. So as you can see, there's lots of questions, there's lots of issues, lots of inconsistency. Um, I hope at this point you agree that given the lack of clear centrally sourced guidance that the industry is operating in a, a variable manner and that, the, that some guidelines are required. Although to be fair, if, 
if you don't agree with that, then the rest of this talk is not really going to work for you. Um, but it's probably worth pointing out that as we started this, there was 468 people registered um, for this webinar. So I think that tells a story in its own right. And it's worth pointing out that a number of years ago, a fellow consultant in an unnamed company told me that nobody cared about birds. Um, so I just wanted to point that one out. Uh, just before I move on, I'd like to show with you, uh, share with you rather, an email I received a couple of days ago in connection with this. I think it sums it up really well. Um, this is from Diana Clark in, in Wales. She said, at the end of the day, as a consultant ecologist, I need the LPA to be happy with any survey technique I recommend to a client. And also they need to be giving consistent advice to applicants and asking for the same level of survey effort from each in similar circumstances. Without consistency, we can end up in a two-tier system where different levels of survey effort or different techniques are accepted or not, which can leave applicants disgruntled and consultants producing different quality assessments, perhaps being undercut by some who follow less stringent guidelines, and therefore not fully assessing and addressing impacts on bird species we are trying to protect. So, what have we done so far? Um, some time back in the, um, I don't know, pre-Cambrian probably, um, I shouted about this issue once too many times um, at the bar, as Des in, uh, <clears throat> insinuated it is in introduction. Um, but anyway, somebody actually called me out and told me to put my money where my mouth was, um, which actually, as it turned out, was exactly what I had to do. Um, but this then led me to um, doing a, a presentation at a SIEM conference. Sometime later, and I'm going to be quite vague on the timelines here because it gets a bit embarrassing. But anyway, sometime later, I convened a meeting of representatives of all the interested parties at the BTO headquarters in Thetford. Following this initial meeting, we established the loose collective that we're now currently referring to as the Bird Survey and Assessment Steering Group. It's currently represented, oh, currently represented on this group are a number of consultancies, BTO themselves, the RSPB, the Association of Local Government Ecologists, uh, the Chartered Institute of Ecology and Environmental Management, SAIM, uh, Natural England and Natural Resources Wales. It was pretty clear to me from the start that in order for these guidelines to have legs, I'm not going to say it about wings, anyway, legs, um, that we needed the collective wisdom of the experts um, from all these organisations. Um, at this point, I want to talk about evidence-based best practice. Uh, Des hinted at this in his introduction, and I promise I won't get my soapbox too much. But it is a theme I'll return to um, as it is a particular hobby horse of mine. In the context of the guidelines we're talking about today, there are some things we know. We have scientific evidence that for, for example, doing breeding bird surveys in the winter is, is wrong. Now, it's an extreme example, but it's wrong, and we have the evidence for that. But there are other things we don't have the evidence for. For example, how many survey visits should we do in each habitat? It's the function of the steering group to reflect the known knowledge in these guidelines, but also where there is no empirical evidence to take a collective informed decision, but while recognizing the fact that the evidence for this is weak or absent. The crucial final part of this approach is that it's then highlighted as a research requirement. I'll come back to that at the end about our ambitions from, from this point of view. But this feedback loop of scientific investigation adding to the evidence base upon which best practice is based is fundamental and is sorely lacking in our industry. For the minute, I wanted to use this just to explain why I felt that the guidelines should be web-based. In fact, spoiler alert, why they are web-based. This constantly repeating feedback loop of science informing and refining best practice, I think lends itself to a web-based platform. It certainly does not, in my opinion, lend itself to publication of a book or, or something similar. Because to be honest, from the minute it's printed, it'll be out of date. Anyway, following this meeting, the first meeting in Thetford, we agreed a number of points and sketched out what we thought should be included in the guidelines and on the website. And this was about as far as we got for a good amount of time. The problem being that we are all have full-time jobs and we're all trying to do this in our spare time. Um, but And so that has been an issue with the guidelines so far, and I'll come back to that towards the end. Um, having said that, during this time, in a sort of a glacial approach, um, we drafted some text, we being biosensors, but at the same time, Paul Watts and Duncan McLaughlin drafted an internal document at Atkins, covering much of what I'm about to show you. 
And thirdly, unbeknown to us at the time, Jamie Dunning at CSA also wrote some guidance. Because this then necessitated an exercise in combining these three documents and translating them into text that could then be put on a website. Over the last six months, however, there's been a huge push to get something up and running. And this is what I'm going to quickly show you around today. Before I do so, I should just say that although the bulk of the text came initially from the people I've just mentioned, there has been significant input from the rest of the steering group and others. The bird survey guidelines are, and I'd imagine always will be, a group effort. As I've said earlier, so far we've limited ourselves to breeding bird surveys. Um, or maybe that should be surveys of breeding birds, but you know what I mean. Um, but as I'll explain in a minute, our ambitions stop nowhere near just doing that. My final point here before we look at the website is that they are very intentionally called guidelines. We are not anywhere near insisting on them being followed as rules. And in fact, I personally feel that a good consultant should, where appropriate, deviate from guidelines and then justify why. We are fully aware that published guidelines can be interpreted as rules. But unfortunately, we can't help, that can't be helped. And all we can do is reiterate over and over again that they are guidelines. They should not be interpreted as rules, if for no other reason than the fact that the rules will be constantly changing. So the website, uh, there's the address. I suppose that's an important point here. I'll put it up at the end as well. Um, the first thing to say is that access to the guidelines at the moment is currently through a registration process. Um, this was done in, uh, entirely to allow for updates to be emailed and, and communicated to everybody that was registered. I feel that things are going to change quite rapidly on the website for the next year or two, and therefore we can keep people informed and up updated by doing that. Um, I have a member of staff that knows about all these sort of things, and I'm assured that we are compliant with all the GDPR rules, and I guess we'll remain so, just to put your mind at rest. Uh, having said that, it does remind me to say that um, Whilst when citing these guidelines, if you ever do, um, there was a citation on the website which you can copy, but one of the things in there is the date accessed. And what we will be doing um, with the hosting is recording um, and keeping a backup, I should say, of all the previous versions of the website so that if you ever need to show somebody what you saw on a certain date, we can then, uh, we can then show you that. Uh, the other main reason for registering people is we're going to open up a discussion forum to the website. Um, and I think it's really important to point out at this point that the uh, collective wisdom of everybody out there doing this day after day is um, hugely important to refining these guidelines. There's at no point as a steering group think um, that we've got it all answered by any stretch of the imagination. So we felt this was the best way of harnessing that collective wisdom and and using it to to refine and better what we've got up here so please register with the website and please engage with the forum and give us your honest feedback because that's at the end of the day this will be as good as all that collective input at this point i was to show the website i was going to jump off powerpoint and and switch to the website um but i basically chickened out so i'm not going to do that unfortunately um it means i've got screen grabs of the website so it's not quite it's going to be quite as dynamic but hopefully if you could just bear with me um before we go any further so this is the home page rather and um, before we go any further though i should say a massive thank you to lisa thrower and rsk biosensors that designed this website and has worked tirelessly to, to get it to the state it's in now um, but also with a significant amount of help from Ruth Walker at the BTO and Catherine Skinner from RSK Biosensors. We have here on the home page summarised the purpose of the guidelines. And if you look at the menu uh, across the top, we have a section on the rationale and under there is some acknowledgements, um, which I'll show you later. But I'm not going to go into the rationale because I've pretty much just done that by <laughs> giving you the background of why we're doing this. Um, so I'll crack straight on to talking about um, the rest of it, scoping methods and so on. Um, I really am not going to go into the details here. Uh, there's a lot more, as you can imagine, on the website. But I will just flick through the options and just to, to highlight a few points that, that I think are, are worth underlining. So the first section here of interest is scoping. Um, I think the, the thing to pull out from here is the one that's bold and underlined. And this was a decision made by the steering group. Um, 
you remember at the start, I was talking about the inconsistency of when bird surveys were done and whether people wanted them done or not. We decided the best way to tackle this was to be having a, a basically a, an opt out rather than an opt in version. So we say that bird surveys should always be scoped in. The key point here, though, to follow up with is to say that they could be very easily scoped out afterwards, but you need to consider them first and have a robust defense about why they're not important. Um, with, by taking this stance, we're hoping that to ensure like at least a minimum of a robust defense in a, in a PEA or a similar report um, to why you didn't do them. Um, and I think that's an important point to um, start with. Um, you know, I refer you back to that car park in Sheffield where I was asked to do 10 surveys. I think saying I'm not going to do them because of X, Y and Z is perfectly legitimate. And there's nothing wrong with saying we're not going to do bird surveys, but they need to be considered and the justification reported. Um, this one here, just to show you the drop downs really from, from scoping. Um, I'm not going to go into these other ones, but Desk Study shows you why and how you can do them. I'm going to talk about some exciting new developments in the pipeline later on about Desk Studies. Um, schedule One says what it is. It's a description of how you consider uh, Schedule One species in your surveys. And then also surveys for international sites, SPAs and, and Ramsars and so on. Obviously, the bulk of the site at the moment is, is very much based on, on methods, because that's, the, that's really its purpose. Um, and as you can see here through the menus, we've got priority species, surveys of breeding birds as an overview, et cetera. So take those in turn. We have um, uh, the priority species we've, is what we've called, what you might call target species or species of interest or species of conservation concern, which are listed on here and so on. So, We've got um, species on the schedule one, section 41, um, red and amber list, the birds of conservation concern, et cetera. Most of you will be familiar with this. Um, so then we have an overview of um, surveys of, of breeding birds. Um, as I said, the website at the moment is only dealing with breeding birds. The ambition is, I'll talk about in a minute, but the ambition is to have it covering lots of different aspects of this, winter birds, et cetera. So, each of those will have its own overview. And on this one, we underline that point that surveys for breeding birds should be um, scoped in and then robustly, um, uh, if they're going to be scoped out, then that should be a, a defense of why. Uh, the actual methodology. Now, I'm hoping on your screens you can see the, the, the menu to the right there in green. It says survey effort, survey timings, etc. Um, this page goes down, down, down through those. And so I'm going to quickly flick through them because I think that's probably the bulk of what I need to talk to you today. Um, the thing uh, to take from this straight away, though, is that in, thing in bold, which is that we are uh, recommending um, six visits um, are undertaken to a site. And this is based on a combination of anecdotal evidence and collective experience in the steering group and, and also one MSc dissertation. Um, we are sure that the number will vary from habitat to habitat, but as things stand, there is simply not the evidence base um, on, on which to base this. Um, the MSC looked at CBC data, Common Bird Census data, where the standard was 10 surveys, and it assumed that after 10, you would pretty much have seen everything. It's slightly flawed, I, we appreciate, which is why we've not published it, but the idea is after 10, you've seen most of them. And so you then back transform that and start looking at the species accumulation curve, and you can work out that after about 5.6 visits, you've seen 90% of the birds, and 6.9, you've got 95%. So we've gone with six for now, um, but this is a great example of where new research would have been able to inform the guidelines. Um, so maybe looking at, we could look at moorland, um, because the, my um, um, anticipation there would be it would be less than six. Um, but you could look at moorland, arable lands, or I don't know, maybe, maybe car parks in northern English cities. Uh, I'll just quickly run through the other ones here, just to uh, summarise the other elements. Um, survey timings, we're saying at the moment half an hour before sunrise until about 11 a.m., uh, but with one visit at dusk, uh, which is really important. I think that's crepuscular species are underrepresented in most of the surveys so far. Um, timing your survey dates, uh, late March to early July is the standard, but but 
it really reiterating the point that, that you vary that according to the dust of the information. If you've got early breeders, um, maybe, I don't know, missile thrush or, or raven or something like that, then you have to go a bit earlier or you've got late multi-breeder species, you might want to push that into, into August. Um, having said that, if you've been asked to do six visits in August in order to meet a deadline for a planning consultant, then you could probably not do that. No, well, it's not recommended, rather. What else we got? Recording conditions. Uh, nothing dramatic here, to be honest. You know, avoid rain and high winds and any other disturbing factors. But where you can't avoid it, then you have to put it down as a limitation to your survey. That's all pretty standard. Um, a bit of a side point, I often see people saying it's a limitation to a survey, but then they don't explain how that affects the interpretation. So it's all well and good saying the survey was a crap, but you know, does that mean you can't interpret the data quite as well as you thought? And how does that influence things? Um, field methods, uh, again, this is just trying to standard, I could suggest a standard approach, it's not insisting on it, but um, transects or routes uh, should be conducted at a slow ambling pace and uh, with the idea that from that route, you have an equal chance of detecting all the birds on that site. With an anticipation, anticipation you're not going to detect them all, but at least you're within this, an, an area that where you would if they were there and making themselves visible or, or heard. Um, species recording itself, I mean, we're saying all species should encountered on the site should be recorded and the priority species mapped uh, with behavioural notations. All secondary species should be listed with an approximate number for each section of the site being recorded. Again, guidelines. Personally, I have to say, I tend to map everything I hear um, or see um, because I can then late, uh, later, I can then ignore all the you know hundreds of wrens I've recorded or whatever, but at least I've recorded it. But again, it's one of those things where you, you can do what you want, but I think as a minimum, all the priority species should be mapped. Um, there's way more detail in, in these web pages themselves about how you would go about doing this. And so I would yeah, strongly recommend that you take time to register and, and read it for yourselves. Um, again, worth pointing out, we want more and more feedback from people. So please just send that in. Uh, the next one down the line there is data. Um, pretty much does what it says on the tin, to be honest. Um, we go through species mapping um, and uh, behavioral notations. Uh, but an important point here is that we are not expecting the, the same level of certainty for breeding evidence as some of the perhaps the BTO schemes. I think knowing that a species is definitely breeding on your site is useful information, especially if it's a Schedule 1. Um, but as a general rule, I think the consultancy world has too much of an obsession with this because if a bird's using your site, the site that's going to be essentially destroyed for housing or whatever, there's a good chance that the site's important to it, whether it's nesting on it or not. And for example, uh, starling springs to mind so they're not limited by nesting site availability but they are limited by foraging opportunity so you could have as many starling nest boxes as you want or houses that host starlings but if you remove the field where they're foraging um, then it's obviously going to um, have a significant impact so the use of the site i think is the important point there um, behavioral notations um, this is just uh, again it's not prescriptive if you've got your own system and it works keep doing it but if you're a junior coming into the industry, then we think it's a useful place for those people to look at the website and then have a, a guide of how they should be doing it. Again, that idea that this is a, a, a central repository of, of this information. And then just quickly, just to blast through the last two, um, legislation, policy and so on, it's all pretty much self-explanatory. It's gonna be an effort to try and keep it up to date, especially in these uncertain times of post-Brexit and the environment bill and, and all these sort of things, but we will we will definitely try our best. I guess that also raises that, that classic caveat when anybody says something legal on these things where this isn't legal advice, it never will be. Um, we're never going to be paid anywhere near as much, as much much money as we need to to do that. And finally, um, additional resources. So again, going back to this idea that this is a central repository. We will put here all those things. We're not in the business of reinventing the wheel. Um, and so if this work's already been done, so wind farms spring to mind, then we can just link to it from here. Um, and you can use this as a, as a hub for all, for all these things for, for consultants. So as you can see, there's a lot of work so far, but really it's just a start off a 10. And I guess there's another advantage of this web-based approach. You can start like this, but then constantly build and refine and not wait until all the questions have been asked. We're not waiting for the, the sort of the perfect thing and then publish it. 
we can get it up and running and refine it as we go. So just finally, I'm just gonna go through quickly what we, our ambitions are for the future. So hopefully we've seen the size of the problem, what we've done so far, and now what we're gonna do next. Um, this is not an exhaustive list by any stretch of the imagination. And again, I know I keep talking about it, but input from the wider community here is critical to us having more future developments. Um, and on that note, straight away, opening up the discussion forum, hopefully that will be up next week. I think we just need to sort out some issues on moderation and, and all those sort of things. Um, there's going to be an article in the BTO News coming out soon with myself and Rob Robinson have written, um, hopefully a future article in, in, in practice. Um, it's, it's a bit of an in-house in thing, but at the moment I describe the steering group as a loose collective, which it is. I think now we, we have an entity out there, we have a website, we are doing stuff that, that we probably need a bit more of a formal structure and, and a set of, of governance um, for the steering group. But also I think we need some funding. I'm not talking about stacks of money, but I think one of the reasons it's taken so long to get to where we have now is because we are all trying to do it in our spare time. And if we had £15,000 a year or something like that, we could employ somebody half-time, part-time to, to actually run the website, to garner the information, to change things, to write stuff, to actually do the doing rather than the thinking and talking about it, which has been the problem so far. So that's going to be going on in the background. Any suggestions or even offers of money, please just uh, email in. Um, practically, we're going to be adding um, elements to the site which are covering things like winter surveys, um, better links to species specific survey techniques. I think passage bird surveys are um, something that have been massively neglected. Um, I personally think that certain sites could, the loss of certain sites to, at certain times of year to certain species could be way more catastrophic than losing their breeding grounds or their wintering grounds. Um, some of these staging posts are critical and I don't think it's, it's done enough. Um, so I think well, I want to put to some of that. Um, but then also other types of survey, and Carlos would have killed me if I'd not said this, um, but acoustic surveys are becoming a thing, um, like they were with the bats sort of 10 years ago or so. And so we need to make sure that we're up to date and keeping up to speed with development in technology and suggesting and pointing people in the right direction for those. So we'll be so they, um, keeping an eye on that. Um, surveyor competency, I said it was a thorny subject. Um, Carlos um, Kohler has been doing quite a lot of work on this already. I'm um, sorry, Marcus Kohler, not Carlos, there's too many. <coughs> that was Carlos and Marcus. Um, yeah, he's been doing a lot of work on this already and he published an article in In Practice uh, last issue, I think it was. Um, we're going to be working with Marcus to, to refine that. Um, I think there's a bit of work to be done to bring it into line with what we were thinking and also into line with what um, the SIEM competency matrix, but it's certainly a key issue that he highlighted there. Um, I'm also, for those of you who haven't seen the article, he's, he's rating people of one to six, essentially. And I'm terrified at the level of expertise needed just to get to level four. Um, so uh, yeah, we might have to tweak that a little bit depending on what the work is. Um, BTO scoping and evaluation tool. Uh, this is really, really exciting. Um, for those of you that know, the BTO collect, um, oh, I have no idea, hundreds of thousands of bits of data each year on birds and the bird distribution um, across the UK. They have a number of schemes running from the BBS, which we talked about, to so bird track where people just log where they've seen things, to atlasing work, to bird ringing, and so on. So the vast amount of data on an annual basis being churned into the BTO allows um, a development of a tool <coughs> that Simon Gillings at uh, the BTO is developing. I just brought crack on with that. I should just uh, name check Rob Robinson at BTO, who's been a stalwart for me in, in getting the, uh, the guidelines to where they are. Um, he was probably one of the poor sods that I was haranguing in a bar at a conference many years ago talking about this, and he stuck with it all the way through. And so I wanted to say thanks to Rob. But also, let's say, Simon is developing, along with all the other people with the brains the size of planets at the BTO, a tool that allows them to harness that data at the BTO. So when you have a site, a location of a site, at the moment you might go to the local record centre, biological record centre, and get some information back, which in my personal experience is usually next to useless because it doesn't tell you, you know, it tells you what's been recorded, not what hasn't, obviously. 
Um, I had once one where the, there were three species mentioned for a site, blue tit, blackbird, and jeer falcon, um, which obviously isn't very useful. A jeer falcon, by the way, exists, it breeds in Iceland and comes here as a vagrant. Um, so having a, this tool where you can say, this is my site, um, what's been recorded in that area is unbelievably useful. But on top of that, they can then start talking about predicting the species that you might have on your site um, because of uh, known associations with habitat and distribution in that part of the world and so on. And that is really useful when it comes to scoping. Take that forward, of course, and that idea of the, the, the big inconsistency about evaluation, um, how important is your site in the geographic context, local or regional and so on. Using the same BTO tool, you can say this site's fairly typical or this site's really unique. And having been able to put and uh, quantitate that uh, uniqueness or, or a value to that site is going to be hugely beneficial. Take that a step further, and of course, it means that you can then have really well informed mitigation proposals. Instead of just saying put up a load of bat, um, bat boxes, it's not going to help birds, put up a load of bird boxes, um, which is to be standard mitigation for, for these sort of things. You could say, what you need to do here is plant a load of stuff for grey partridge because we know in this region, this is a real stronghold and we're trying to build that network of grey partridge habitat. So it becomes a, a regionally applicable mitigation, not just a site-based one. So the power of what the BTO have is something that really excites me and I think there's, there's a lot to be done there. The final point here for the future developments is going back to what I said before about the evidence base um, feedback loop into best practice. And I think at the moment, we know as a steering group, we have a lot of research questions. And I want to have a web page, um, a page, sorry, on the website is a research portal where it lists the research questions and why they're applicable and, and the problems. And then we engage with academics that have uh, honors students projects they need to supervise or MSc projects. And they, sort of book out or, or check out some of these research questions and say, we're going to go and look at that. And they go away and do it. They write up their thesis or dissertation. It yeah, then gets sent to, uh, sent to the steering group. Uh, we assess it. And if what they've done is, is good quality and it changes our thinking and our understanding of the science, then we change the guidelines in light of that. They get referenced. Um, but then the important bit here is that we ask them to then suggest further questions. Nobody's ever done a scientific um, inquiry without generating more questions than they started with and those questions need to come back in and that then generates this feedback loop of refinement for the best practice guidelines that are evidence-based. So just to finish the three main points I want you to take away from today um, that these are guidelines they're not rules it's the important one. Uh, the steering group is intentionally populated with representatives across all the major interested parties and I want that to, if we'd set it up just as a consultancy, a group of consultants, there would have been accusations of, of you know, <laughs> I was going to say feathering your own nest, but you know what I mean, um, the idea of work generation and so on. But I think everybody's on here, we can be objective and claim to be objective, and that's what I want to be. Um, and the third point is that the guidelines are web-based here to allow for this constant change and adaptation in light of new evidence. And my final point before I finish is just, I actually be really keen to hear from people representing other taxa groups, not just birds, um, within the consultancy world, because I think um, I'd like to see this rolled out or this approach taken with other, other groups. So I think as an industry, we need to sort of get to grips with this feedback and this evidence base. Um, yeah, so just get in touch if that's the case. Um, just want to say this, this is the list of the people on the steering group, and then also just to acknowledge the people that have contributed over the last two or three years <clears throat> to get them to where they are and with the website creation as well through Lisa and Catherine and Ruth. I'm going to stop there, but thank you very much. Okay, thanks very much, Tim. Um, I'm sure I'm not alone in thinking this is a really exciting initiative and uh, probably relevant to some other taxa uh, as well. So um, we've gone a little bit over time. Um, so uh, uh, those attendees who need to leave, we won't uh, we won't blame you for it. But if you're willing to hang around for a few more minutes, then I'm going to try to get through uh, just a handful of questions. So we'll probably stay on online for just a few minutes uh, to get through some of those. So the, the first question uh, is something that's been picked up by a couple of people, which is 
Uh, on the steering group, uh, there doesn't seem to be representation from either Scottish or Northern Irish uh, bird groups or um, um, uh, statutory bodies. Is there a is there a reason for that? No reason other than that they, they haven't engaged so far. Um, we've uh, asked for their engagement and influence um, to be brought to bear on this so far, and um, they haven't yet. But I'm, I'm pretty sure that having their input will be hugely beneficial, and I'm hoping will once this gets momentum, they will engage with it. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, there's another question here about um, how to get LPAs and uh, statutory uh, nature conservation bodies to treat these guidelines as such, as guidance rather than as rules. And many consultants, of course, will be frustrated by, uh, by uh, a certain lack of flexibility around, uh, around guidance that's been issued by other organisations. Yeah, <clears throat> I think I, I take the reference to the other organisations. Um, I think all we can we can do, and like I said in my in my talk, that um, is keep reiterating the fact that they're guidelines. Um, we perfectly acknowledge that often they're interpreted as rules, and it's easy, and I understand why it happens that people in LPAs and other organisations just it's easy to point to these and say do it like this, and they that then comes across as you know intransient, and that's the way it should be done. But if we you know, maybe we need to put it across the website over and over and over again. This is guidelines. Um, you know, if you have, if you can justify departure from these guidelines, then please do. And you know, I personally, I think I, I've got a lot of respect for consultants that do so because it's the same with things like bats and stuff like that. That you know, they are just guidelines, and in certain circumstances, you, if you can justify why you've done something differently, then that's absolutely perfectly acceptable. And in fact, it's your responsibility as a professional. I would say. Yeah, I, I think inserting some explicit uh, text to that effect uh, on the website would probably be very useful. Yeah. Um, so another question here. Um, this is about uh, scoping in and scoping out surveys. Uh, can you give any further examples of where you might not need bird surveys, perhaps relating to the size of the site, quality of the habit, the extent of suitable habits, etc., or where effort might be reduced? It's hard to be specific um, without coming up with lots of different versions. And obviously, I use the, the Sheffield car park example as an extreme version of why why would you bother full stop pretty much. Um, I think uh, as, as professionals, things like the size of the site and the location of the site, the habitats on the site, and also the results of the desk study should all inform that. If you've done a desk study and nothing dramatic has come back, the site's tiny, it's a monoculture of a, the one that springs to mind is one I've done fairly recently, which was um, intensively pasture land. And there was a green desert with two species on it after the first visit. You, you sort of know as a professional that this is pretty much pointless. It's one field, it's a rubbish hedge, and there's two species. Um, I think at that point, you need to just say, you know, we did two surveys or three surveys or whatever, in the appropriate time of year and we still didn't you know we still only got the three you know the dunnock the great tit and the chaffinch that we got on the first visit and therefore we decided to stop i don't think if you can justify that and back it up then i don't think there's a problem with that i think it's quite hard to be prescriptive though and i think i we would as the guidelines we would probably veer away a little bit from being prescriptive because there's too many moving parts in that i think to actually write something down and people to use or misinterpret it as rules maybe Sure. <clears throat> okay, the next question is about uh, a wintering bird surveys. Uh, there are currently six visits are recommended. Do you think that's sufficient? This is kind of going to the nub of the of the question about evidence, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, with um, sounds like a cop out, but it does depend on the site again, to be honest. And most of the winter visits that happen now are driven by by they tend to be wetland sites. And they're sort of done in and around the web counts and, and things like that. Um, either that or they're um, perhaps moorland, moorland jobs with, with wind farms and so on, where the guidance is pretty clear as well. Um, so I think there's work to be done on generic uh, winter bird surveys. Um, and at the moment, six seems to fit quite well. It tends to be done once a month across the winter months and does actually pick up some of the passage movement of birds as well. Um, but yeah, we'll have to wait and see what the science says, I think. 
Okay. Um, so another question here about um, whether you were thinking of, uh, of extending this, this concept into perhaps providing guidelines for uh, ECAL supervision as part of managing development and maintenance works. Do you know whether that specifically means ECAL in general or ECAL in relation to birds? It does not say. I, I assume it means in general. Okay. Um, we hadn't, no. Um, there, I know that there's a, a large piece of work being done at the moment um, by SAIM and a few other organisations for an ECAR accreditation scheme. Um, I think um, it's been backed with some of the big infrastructure projects as well. So I think that side of things is probably going to be covered. I, what I, the reason I asked to clarify was often this, this idea of nesting checks. So scrub removal or tree removal during the breeding season and whether nesting checks are adequate or not is, is a hot topic um, and is um, it's a tough one to deal with because at the end of the day, the people doing the checking are the key bit to that. If they really know what they're doing and they're going to find pretty much every nest, then that's as a system, it works. The problem is when you have e-cows that aren't specialist bird nest finders, and I can assure you most of them aren't. So yeah, there is an industry problem, but it's not one I'm going to be tackling here, that's for sure. So, so that segues beautifully into the next question, which is um, a suggestion uh, that we prioritise guidance for nesting bird checks, uh, as the way it's undertaken varies enormously. Uh, and there are many examples of it not being done properly by mm -hmm. inexperienced staff. So, I, I, I yeah, I entirely agree. Um, I. Yeah, I made myself very unpopular on a scheme donkeys years ago by, you know, I had, I was pretty good at finding nests. I'd been trained how to do it before I became a consultant and I kept finding nest after nest and putting barrier tape up at five metre radiuses around this nest and, and pretty much covered the whole area by the time the, the end of the first couple of days. The same things happen and you put, a, I'm going to say a junior member of staff, but it's, it doesn't have to be junior, it just means to be inexperienced and they won't find any nests and the whole thing gets blitzed and nobody ever really knows. It, as I say, it's a hot topic. I think it probably needs a little bit of, um, I don't know, a level of accreditation maybe, maybe a training program that is accredited that means that the people that have that accreditation are, um, are qualified to find nests and that you can be confident that they will find them. Of course, having said that all that, the easiest way to avoid this problem is to take out all your scrub and trees outside of the breeding season. And of course, a lot of developers forget about that and then just think this is a cop out. Um, and or put you know mesh over hedges and things like that that yeah. it's just yeah idiotic to say the least but anyway so, so that, yeah. that, food, food for thought though food for thought that question of competence comes up again um is there a section within the guidelines which covers minimum surveyor competencies perhaps for, for different activities not yet, no. Um, but that is, as I said, towards the end of our future ambitions, it's right at the top of the list of where we need to go next, I think. I think it's a really, it's a tricky issue to deal with because it's, you know, there's lots of problems with it. How do you measure it? How important? It, if you start measuring it, do you accredit people? Do you actually say you're a surveyor at level three and therefore you're almost generating a weird hierarchy within the industry? It's, it's not straightforward um, to deal with, but it's something that we're determined to get to the bottom of because it is um as anybody that works in the industry knows they will have come across people doing a breeding bird service or bird service in general that are just totally incompetent and you know often then then they know they're incompetent but quite often they don't even know they're incompetent and that's the scariest thing so i think as an industry or as a particular niche within an industry we really need to tackle it and get to the bottom of it so it's a big challenge but it's one that's top of our list Okay, great. Well, we've got quite a few more questions um, and I think uh, we've run out of time really. So I think what we're going to do is we'll try to uh, try to get answers back uh, where we can. I'm sure Tim will be busy this afternoon doing just that, hopefully. Um, and so uh, so thanks to everyone for, uh, for joining today. Um, just a reminder that you'll get uh, a request for some feedback uh, on this webinar um, shortly. And uh, we hope you'll take the time to fill that out because it will help us refine uh, these events. Our next first Thursday webinar will be on the 27th of May, and that's when our aquatic specialist, uh, Pete Walker, will be talking about uh, the spread of non-native crayfish in the UK. So um, I hope many of you will be able to join us then. 
But in the meantime, uh, thanks very much for joining us today. And uh, it's goodbye from me. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye.